Okay, so it is Saturday, it is half 12, and last week was a year exactly since I quit my job in order to pursue a career in art full time. It was the biggest leap of faith of my life so far, and a decision that has come with a lot of lessons to learn along the way. So now that I'm here, I wanted to share with you how I came to that decision, how it's been working out for me, you know, how I knew I was ready, how I fared financially, and also just sort of how I structure my life, my day-to-day, -day, my budget, now that I'm self-employed. So it's gonna be a long one, grab your snacks, get a drink ready. I don't have any Capri Sun today, but I do have an innocent smoothie just for kids. Um, grab your sketchbook or anything else you're working on, and let's talk art together. So if you're new to this series, The Underpainting is a little segment where we chat about different art issues while we hang out together. Just kind of peel back the layers of work and mystery that go into crafting a creative life and make sense of everything that goes on behind the scenes. I am today drawing a couple of drawings in my sketchbook. I am drawing the house that I grew up in. I thought I would draw this house, but then I don't want anyone finding me. And I'm also, if we have time, going to draw and watercolour a house that I found just having a wander through Google Maps Street View. Um, just had a little wander through the East Sussex countryside um, looking for a nice little cottage to draw. So if we have time, I'll do that as well. Um, I'm going to be using one of my pit artist pens in this size small. And if I get around to using the watercolours, I'll be using my WH Smith's watercolours in my portable painter palette. But you'll see that once we get to it. And as always, all the tools will be listed below in case you want to check those out. Um, the reason I'm doing this is actually I've decided to open up my commissions for the first time in probably like two years. Um, purely doing drawings of buildings so like if someone wants their house to be drawn or like what I'm doing the house they grew up in stuff like that I have set that up now on my shop so you can check it out I will have that linked below if you want a custom drawing of a building of your choice and they'll be in either just ink like I'll be doing on this one or ink and watercolor different size options have a look below see if it's something you'd be interested in Right, so today's topic is something that I get asked about a lot. I get a lot of emails from like high school students or people just finishing uni, um, people who are interested in pursuing a career in art, but don't really know where to begin with that, what are their next steps might be, and you know, how do you get to be earning money from making art. So my journey to where I am now has not been a straightforward one. It's not the kind of thing that I feel I can give like a step-by-step -step guide of how to get there. Um, but what I can do is at least just share my experience, my story, and you know, if it helps anyone, then that would be great. So last year, 13th of September, was my last day at work. I had spent the last like three and a half years working at a supermarket and like sometimes I stocked the shelves sometimes I worked on the tills um, but my main job was actually to check the dates on every single short life item in the shop so things like sausages cartons of milk um, profiteroles I would have to go up and down every single aisle up and down every single shelf going through individual items checking the dates on them and obviously it was in the fridge section so it was freezing um, very repetitive as well I'd be doing that for like four to eight hours a day and then the next day I would come in and check the exact same items that I had checked the day before um, it sounds pretty <laughs> awful it sounds quite grim but um, the thing about me is I do quite enjoy repetitive actions. I like, um, I don't know, I quite like the monotony of things like that. I like being able to come into a job, come into work every day and know what my what I have to do that day. I don't really have to talk to anyone. I can just sort of grab my tools and get on with it. Um, I'm kind of a paradox of a creative person, I think, just because like, if I wasn't an artist, I would love to either work on like a factory assembly line, doing the same thing over and over and over, or I've always, always, always wanted to work in like a sorting office, in a post office. Like, if I wasn't an artist, that's like my dream job. But I did, you know, grow up with the idea that I wanted to be an artist from a very, very young age. I loved drawing and 
I was always kind of told that I was good at it. So I thought that that would be something that I could just do as a job forever. My main dream as a child was to write and illustrate children's books um, because I loved drawing and I loved reading. It just seemed like the ideal combo for me to come to put those two together and write little stories and be able to draw along. Um, I really loved people like uh, Quentin Blake who did the illustrations for um, Roald Dahl's books. Also, I can't remember who did the Jekyll and Wilson illustrations, but those were quite a staple of my childhood. I think anyone that read a Jekyll and Wilson book will remember the illustrations that went along with them. But as I got older, that idea, that dream kind of faded, not for any particular reason, just just kind of moved on from it. Like when I was about 13, I started watching CSI and I suddenly wanted to be a uh, forensic scientist. And I was properly obsessed. That went on for quite a while. I don't think I genuinely wanted to be a forensic scientist. I was more um, interested in like, living a really snazzy life in Miami with the hot co-stars. Um, and then after that, my next thing was that I wanted to be an interpreter. I really love learning languages. I really love listening to languages. And I thought that would be a great, great career path. I was about 16 at that time. And that is a time, I don't know how it works like around the world, but that's a time like here in the UK where we start doing our GCSEs. So we choose our GCSE topics, our GCSE subjects, um, in order to move on to our A-level subjects, in order to go to university, and then obviously to get a degree and get a job. So it was a time where people were starting to think about what path they were gonna take. And being an interpreter was something that I was quite happy with as an idea. I genuinely do enjoy languages and learning them. So I did well, I got, um, A's in my A-levels for English, English, Spanish and art and a B in French just because that was the one time in my life that I decided to spoil my 100% uh, attendance rate and start skipping classes. So could have done better, but overall I did really well in school, um, got the grades that I needed to get into my first choice of university, which was King's College London, and there I started to study English and Spanish for my degree. So I was on track in life, um, like the whole sort of ideal plan that you have when you're going through school and stuff, I was definitely on track to getting to where I wanted to be and I was also still kind of drawing here and there. I guess like once you start drawing at school, um, you know, for coursework and stuff, it kind of takes away the fun of things. So not drawing as much as usual, but still doing a lot for coursework and also I had quite an interest in like deviant art um, at the time. So I would go on there and sort of get inspired out of nowhere and want to draw. It's the kind of thing where you see something great, you see people doing these really cool drawings and things and you just want to do something similar. You want to do something just as cool and put that out there and have other people see that. So that was sort of the extent of the art that I was doing at the time. Um, so yeah, I got into King's. Um, it was a great uni, um, met a lot of nice people, but uh, overall, um, yeah, I like, I hated it. I genuinely hated it. If I had to think of like a rock bottom in my life, that would definitely be it because all of a sudden, all the things that I had been working for, all the plans that I had made, every step of the way, doing well in these exams, to do well in these exams, to get into this uni, to get my degree and get my job, it all kind of fell apart and I was stuck there thinking, ah, like, I don't want this, I'm not interested in this, I don't want to be here. Um, and it was a very kind of, who am I time and like, what do I want? What am I going to do? Um, I felt very lost, very, uncomfortable in my own life and just kind of started having my lowest days. I think at the same time um, my anxiety was probably at its worst but at the time I didn't really know uh, what anxiety was so it was all just a bit of a mess. Also at the same time I had been working at a 
train station um, a little coffee kiosk on the platform if you've ever been to broccoli station um, platform two on the overground there is a coffee kiosk on the platform um, and I used to work there 6 a.m. every day making coffee for the grumpy oh, grumpy rush hour commuters um, lots of free coffee though so it was kind of worth it but yeah, because at the time they were working on changing the East London line to the overground, there was a lot of um, engineering works, which meant that the station was closed a lot of the time, which eventually led to me having to be let go from that job, which was a shame, but also not that deep. Like it really wasn't a position that I saw myself staying in for very long anyway. Um, I also around that time had got my license and bought my first car and realized that I hated driving. Driving filled me with so much dread. I would get behind the steering wheel of my car, be shaking and I'd feel sick and I wouldn't want to drive anywhere. So my car was just sitting outside my house most of the time while I was paying insurance and road tax and all that kind of nonsense that goes with owning a car. So I was at a stage where all these things that I had been building towards, getting into uni, having a job, having a car, I felt like a proper person and it all just kind of flatlined kind of all at once and i found myself just kind of drifting and floating in this not liking where i was but not knowing where i wanted to be um and so still not really knowing what my next step was not knowing what i was going to like move on to i decided that whatever happened I didn't want to be where I was at so without a plan or anything without like a plan B I just dropped out of uni stopped going um, that was hard and my parents um, understandably were a bit you know I think we were all shocked because I'd always been very good and very reliable and I just always had it together and did well so I think you know I was kind of shocked and confused about what was going on obviously my parents were as well and I understand now that had I said you know okay I'm not working anymore I'm selling my car I'm dropping out of uni but I have a plan I guarantee they would have been behind me 100% especially if I had said I want to be an artist I want to do art because you probably would have said like oh great yeah finally we've been saying that you should do that like your whole life so but obviously because I didn't do that um, and they could just sort of see me drifting and floundering it was a hard time a very tense time um, but at the same time there was a lot of there was a lot of support and understanding you know they put up with quite a lot of crap from me in that time where I was lost and confused so for the next few months maybe up to a year i lived off my student loan which was still coming in i spent a lot of that on a trip to greece and uh, a laptop and a dslr camera because that was a time where everyone was kind of into photography and buying that dslr camera when i had that money was one of the best things that i could have done for myself it's one of those things that really helps helped for things to fall into place without me realizing it at the time so i also spent a lot of time um and money a lot of money um on nights out at that time so i was 18 or 19 um i had no job i had a lot of free time and i was just kind of drifting so that was kind of one of like the worst times in my life but also weirdly one of the best times like I felt like absolute garbage <laughs> I felt like completely worthless and completely lost but at the same time it was nice to finally have a moment the first time ever where there was no structure and no commitments I was just completely free and somewhere along the way I started drawing again just for fun I was surrounded at that time by a lot of creative people a lot of my nights out were spent at lots of local live music events um, lock-ins in pubs open mic nights and jam sessions and stuff like that and being around those people um, just kind of reminded me that 
that kind of life exists. There are people out there who are creative and who do that as their thing and they share it with other people. So I desperately wanted to be a part of that again because I remembered that I used to be that kind of person. So I was drawing again and in the time that I hadn't been focused on drawing, things like Instagram and Pinterest had popped up. So there was this huge new bank of inspiration for me just just waiting to be discovered. And so like with DeviantArt, I was seeing all these things. I loved seeing like an artist's full body of work, the things that you don't normally see, the behind the scenes, seeing real people living life as artists and you know creating these amazing pieces and putting them out there um and as i said like with deviant art i loved seeing that and i wanted to be part of it so i started posting art on my own um personal instagram and then eventually i moved on to a separate one i think mainly because i find sharing my art with my friends quite cringe and i don't really I, I mean i'm still really bad at showing them things that i draw and i just wanted to keep it private i kind of wanted to build up a following before i shared it with anyone because it was weirdly embarrassing for me and the more i got into it the more i realized that these other people that i'm seeing and admiring are really making a living out of this especially using their online presence so I quite naturally got into looking at um, like branding and marketing. Um, I, I, I watched a lot of YouTube videos on like search engine optimizations, things like that, mainly out of curiosity, but then I would end up applying that to everything I did afterwards. And the timeline of things is kind of unclear for me, but at some point, I decided to set up a YouTube channel, um, again, because it was something that I was consuming so heavily that I just wanted to be part of it. I wanted to be even more deeply into it and there's no better way than making your own channel. Now, obviously at that point, um, none of it was making money. I obviously had hoped that it would make money, but um, when you're first starting out, I think that's it just takes a long, long time to start seeing any real return on it. So eventually, uh, my student loan money finally ran out. I sold my car, that money ran out as well. So I ended up getting a job at a local supermarket, um, just the Sainsbury's down the road from me. And on the day of my induction, um, it was me, a guy called Sam and a girl called Sonia. Sonia left pretty soon after we all started, but me and Sam uh, became really good friends because we were kind of in a similar position where we just needed this job as a temporary thing. We were both trying to work on our own passions in the background. Um, so he, so obviously I was working on trying to build a career as an artist. He was trying to work on setting himself up as a personal trainer. Um, so his dream was to, you know, open a studio or have his own space, have a sort of portfolio of clients that he could be training here and there and earn his money from that. So we connected on that level and ended up working there for quite some time. I was kind of working on building my art career, but I really didn't fully commit to it. I think it's very much in my nature to be lazy and not put 100% into anything. So. It took me a lot longer than it should have done for me to start seeing any sort of progress with things in that aspect. The great thing about things like YouTube is that they do sort of generate their own growth. So things were growing for me quite steadily, um, quite slowly. I remember the first sort of hundred was such a struggle. And then the first thousand thing, those sorts of milestones really took a long time. but. There was a steady kind of growth in the background. I think within maybe a year, year and a half, I started to see money from it. The threshold to get a paycheck from YouTube is 60 pounds. So I started earning like 60 pounds a month from YouTube, which obviously wasn't enough for me to be uh, full time. But in the meantime, I had been enjoying my work at Sainsbury's. I, you know, I liked, being out of the house, it was something to, it sort of helped me build up more people skills, I guess, and just gave me a much thicker skin because when you're working in retail, you definitely need that. People 
do not treat you like a human being. Um, but I met a lot of great people. I made a lot of friends there and it was definitely a nice chapter of my life. But eventually I did kind of get to a point where I'd had enough. I'd been there for like two and a half years. I hadn't anticipated on being there for that long and I just thought, okay, it's time to kick my butt into gear and start working on a plan to get me out of here. So that's when I sat down and sort of wrote out a quite detailed financial plan, a sort of guide to what I need to do, how much money I need to be making, how I can make that money through my art in order to be able to leave. So um, I've always, I'd say since I was about um, 18, I've had to pay a rent for living at home. Um, and by that point, because I was probably 20, 20 ish, it was, a, while it was reasonable, it was something that I needed to have a job to be able to pay. I needed to be earning a substantial amount of money. So my main goal was to be able to be earning that much money to where I could pay my bills, my phone bills, stuff like that, and the rent to be living at my house. And then anything else I didn't really need, like I just needed to be able to survive. So I wrote down that number and thought about what parts, how much am I making now from my art and how can I make that more um, in order to add up to what I need. So I thought about, you know, how much I'm making from YouTube, how can I make more, I could put out more videos, stuff like that. Um, just, uh, I literally wrote down this whole plan and had the amount of money at the top that I needed to be earning and sort of broke that down into, you know, ideal goals of where those funds could be coming from, um, purely from art. But obviously it isn't as easy as that. You can't just write a plan and then it falls into place. So um, things did kind of stall after that. I, again, didn't put in as much work as I should have done. I had written out this plan, but didn't really follow it. Um, and also it was a very idealized plan, you know, like in the best circumstances, that's how much I would be making. One piece of advice I will give if you are planning on leaving your job um, in order to pursue self-employment, um, try to save at least three months worth of essential money. So rent money, anything you need to pay and can't sort of live without food money, save three months worth of that and then you're in a better position to leave. Um, I wouldn't just leave um, having had like a month's savings or anything like that, just just because you never know what unforeseen circumstances might pop up and what you might need that money for. And you don't wanna be just stuck without any funds whatsoever. So I was saving in the background, which definitely helped me a bit later on. Um, it just didn't really click fully for me. And then another year passed really quickly and I had been there for three plus years and uh, Sam, my friend, left. Uh, he handed in his resignation. He had built up his personal training business enough to a point where he could leave. He had made it and um, I was stupidly proud of him and I still am. So a week after he left, I handed in my resignation, um, I handed in my notice to leave within a month and I wasn't ready but I think that at that point I needed to do that because I was too comfortable in that job and I was never going to push myself, I just know with me I was never going to push myself um, until things got kind of desperate so I put myself in the position where I was going to have to work harder on my art because I wasn't going to be earning money elsewhere. So. Obviously, thankfully, I had been saving. I don't think I would have left if I didn't have the savings that I'd built up. For a few months of survival, um, I actually had quite an eventful summer that year. That was the year that I went to Spain and um, we had a great holiday, but it was quite a disastrous holiday. A lot of things went wrong and there were a lot of unforeseen expenses. So a lot of that money that I had saved to uh, survive off comfortably had to be spent on all sorts that I won't really go into because it's a long story.
By this point, I was, however, earning a few hundred a month from YouTube. So again, that was just enough really to pay my rent. Um, anything else would come out of my savings. So just, you know, things like, like food and shampoo and travel, that was all slowly eating away at my savings. But all in all, I was staying afloat. At that point, um, because I had, I would say about 50 to 80,000 subscribers, um, I was getting more sponsorship deals and those are a godsend, um, just in terms of getting a check, essentially, just getting a proper sum of money for still doing what you love, still doing your usual thing, but you're getting a little boost, a little financial boost from it. So those very few sponsorships that I did made it possible for me to keep going with things would really bring me back from the edge of complete like financial ruin. I also spent a lot of time uh, in my overdraft, so essentially spending money that I didn't have. Um, pretty much building a small debt, I think it got to the limit eventually. Um, but in the back of my mind, I did know that if it got to the point where I was completely broke and I had nothing left, there was still going to be a job waiting for me at my old workplace. When I left um, Sainsbury's, the manager told me that if I wanted to come back, then I could. So that was always there as a backup, but at the same time, I knew whatever happened, I wasn't going back there. There's no way. Um, but there was always the backup plan of if it doesn't work out, I'm just going to have to get another job. You know, I'm not going to get myself into a position that I can't come back from. I'm not going to build up a huge amount of debt. Also, that's why it's taken me this long to sort of announce on this channel even that I quit my job because as far as you guys knew, I was um, working. I think quite a few people here are new, so they might not even know that, but um, the people that have been with me for a while would have remembered me talking about my job at the old supermarket. Um, and I didn't sort of announce that I had left, that I'd become full-time because it really wasn't like, this is it now, I'm ready, we're doing it. It was like, I'm gonna try this and see if it works and it might not work, so I'm not gonna tell anyone yet. Um, so my next challenge was sort of becoming a good boss, being my own boss and, you know, making sure that I got work done, being consistent and motivated. And within the first couple of months after I left my job, that was around September, October time, I think I spent at least a month not doing anything. I completely lost all focus, all motivation, and I could tell myself I really need to do stuff because I am hemorrhaging money right now and I'm in control of earning the money, um, but it just didn't materialize in that way. So that is when I actually started my 30 Ways to Fill a Sketchbook series. Um, I, again, had sat myself down, with a notepad, this, that's the only way for me to sort of sort things out in my head. And I wrote out different ways that I could challenge myself to be more consistent. It was a way that I could get myself into a rhythm of filming, of editing, of drawing regularly. And even though I had a few hiccups along the way in terms of recording as often as I wanted to, um, it ended up being just what I needed to get me back into a swing of things, it really challenged me to get some solid content out there and sort of figure out who I was as an artist and also as a YouTuber. I forgot to mention as well, way, way back, I did start selling my original artwork and prints maybe within like the first year of um, starting to take art seriously. So, um, however, I did value things quite low just because, um, well, A, because I was working at the time, I didn't really need that money and also, I didn't value my work very highly at that time. Um, but if you are someone that you see yourself as an artist and you see your work being worth a lot, then I definitely think you should charge a lot. I think it says a lot more about you as an artist. It gives you more credibility. So I was making like 10 pounds a month from my actual art. A lot of my money came from YouTube back then. Um, at this point, 
I was making a lot more money from prints and um, selling original pieces of artwork. I had a lot more confidence in my work and therefore I felt happier charging more. And the more I do develop as an artist, the more confident I feel about, you know, charging people for the time that it took and the, the materials that went into it and also the whole thought process behind it. And also after the 30 Ways for the Sketchbook series, I gained a lot of subscribers, I, which gained a lot of more traffic for my YouTube channel, which in turn meant more earnings from AdSense and stuff. It also led to a lot more of a following in general. So a lot more people that were willing to check out my work and buy my work. So it all kind of grew and grew and grew very slowly, but it all fed into each other. And I eventually got to a point where financially I was doing better than I had been doing at my job, my job job. Um, and that was probably just a few months ago. And doing better financially meant that I was now in a position to save, which is so, so important when you are self-employed because you don't get things like holiday pay. Uh, so if you need a week off, you're not getting paid for that. You don't get any sick leave, which means, you know, if you're in bed for a week or even a month with something, um, that's all time that you will be essentially losing money because you're not able to create the things that you put out in order to sell them. So having money saved is very, very important. So as soon as you can start saving, I would definitely recommend it. I now um, have two separate bank accounts. So one where I get paid for everything like YouTube and prints and originals, things like that, that all goes into one place. And from that, I pay myself a wage so that that money goes on art supplies and anything else postage and packaging things like that and then the rest of that is and whatever I make in a month depends on how well I do as a company um, but that obviously is money that I'll spend on food and you know personal things so it's been a very slow and steady process but it's been almost a snowball it's been the growth has been kind of exponential so the longer you do it the bigger things will grow the more money will come in and the easier it kind of becomes to be able to see yourself as an artist I think now looking ahead at what I want to make of this career you know as a future I've been thinking a lot more about that recently um, for the same reason that I made this video the that I'm feeling a lot more confident in my art and my career as an artist. Um, so looking ahead, I love to, I love the idea of doing things like this. I love um, breaking down my experiences and the lessons that I've learned and being able to share that as almost a guide for people who were in a position like me of, you know, self-doubt or just being unsure. So moving forward, I would love to be able to do that in all sorts of ways. Um, to finish off with some advice, I would first say if you are in school and you know that you want to be an artist, it's still important to focus on your studies for now. That's one of the things I get emailed about the most, where someone is saying that, you know, um, their parents are telling them to focus on their maths homework and they just want to draw focus on your studies now because you have all the time in the world to work on your art it's really important to build up that um strong work ethic that comes from being at school and doing things that you don't necessarily want to do it's really important to just build the skills that you can at that time so you're not looking back and thinking oh, i wish i could work out percentages because now i need to do my taxes you never know how those things that you learn then when you have the chance are going to translate into your life in the future you never know what position that might put you in above other people as an artist even so build as much knowledge as you can do your best it's not about doing well necessarily it's about doing your best putting in your all and committing to the things that you have to at those times um, you can do art in your free time you know, I remember being at school and there was always time for it. As stressed as I was, um, you know, I could either go on 
MySpace after school because that was a thing back then, not YouTube, or I could do some drawing. So there is always at least a little bit of time for it. Um, another piece of advice, um, kind of following on from that, is to create as much as you can and do it for you. Um, we, especially when we're younger, I think it's important to express yourself the best you can because there's so much outside influence. Do the things that you want to do, draw what you want to draw, create as much as possible and really explore different ideas and explore your style and see who you are as an artist and be open to trying new things and changing and just letting it flow. There's no pressure to be a certain type of artist, there's no pressure to do things in a certain style. Do you and just enjoy it. Um, another thing I would say is if you know that being an artist is what you want to do in your life and this applies to anyone any age um, start taking the steps to figure out how you can make that a possibility so look into different professions that artists can go into whether that's design or animation think about what you want to do as an artist and then look at people that have done it what they what steps they took to get there what schools did they go to what did what did they study things like that just be take a very sensible and clinical look at the path you want to take and just really consider all your options. And if you're not sure if you want to be an artist, if you do art as a hobby and you don't know if it's something that you do want to make a career out of, that's absolutely fine. Just, you know, keep your options open. You can become an artist at age 14. You can become an artist at age 84. It really doesn't matter. Just create art if you want to create art and if you want to make money from it, then follow that path. But if not, and then continue to just enjoy it as a hobby. Right, and my final piece of advice would be um, don't wait until you're ready because you will never be ready. And jumping in at the deep end is the thing that made the biggest difference for me. Obviously you wanna be in a position where you have a safety net, but you don't need to build a fort around you where nothing can go wrong and you've got all bases covered. You need to dive in and make mistakes in order to learn and see what works and what doesn't. Right, so that's all I have to say on this for today, but I would love to hear about your experiences or your goals in the comments below. Big thanks to all of you for watching and for staying tuned to the end. As I've said before, without you, this show would not be possible. The time it takes, the equipment I use, the tools I use, it would all be non-existent. Special thanks to my patrons whose support makes all the difference. If you are interested in supporting me on Patreon, I'll have that linked below. There you can see high resolution images of each and every sketchbook page that I do as and when they happen, as well as behind the scenes pictures of what I'm up to. I also do a weekly real time sketchbook Q&A, so you can have your question answered while you watch me draw in real time. And the occasional bonus video in there as well. I'm also gonna have the time lapse of this and this page as well for you to see the full process all together. So it's patreon.com forward slash semi skimmed min. We would love to have you over there. For now, this underpainting is over. Thank you so much for joining me and I will see you in the next one. Bye.